politics and leadership. Uh, I myself had had the opportunity a number of years ago to go on a German icebreaker to actually retrace the Shackleton expedition going from the Ushuaia port to South Georgia Island and then down into the Weddell Sea and around in the ice. We actually got trapped in the same ice and were drifting for a while, but fortunately we had a little stronger hull and such and steamed our way out of the ice and then followed the course up to Elephant Island and then to back to South Georgia Island. And I can say personally that it's a journey that I would not like to do in an open boat. Though I would go again if uh, Ernest Shackleton asked me to. And this story is really a tale of uh, human courage. As he himself said, we have reached into the naked soul of man. And this was a trip that was a failure in the sense he did not achieve his goals, but just by surviving and rescuing all of his men, uh, he was a hero of his time and a measure for expeditionary leaders to this day. Now, he himself was born in Ireland in County Kildare. He was the son of a doctor who was an English Quaker, actually, so he was Anglo-English. And he then, as a young boy, moved to London, was based from there through the rest of his life. Uh, his um, training was rudimentary. He was a so-so student, and he did not do well, and he always was yearning to break free and do something different. And so as a young lad of 16, he actually signed on to be a cabin boy on, in the merchant service, and then he spent many years in, as a career sailor, working sail and steamships, doing hard labor, and then he took examinations and worked his way up to be a merchant officer. Uh, then uh, at the time when there was a interest in polar navigation and there was a race going on between different nations to go further south, he signed up in the Royal Ge Geographic Society to then uh, take the first trip with uh, Robert Scott down to Antarctica. Because he had had rough and ready training as a sailor, he knew both steam and sail, he was considered a very valuable member of an expedition. Uh, when he was a younger man, he married a woman, Emily Shackleton, uh, and he s had tried to work in different businesses on land, but as a sailor, uh, he told his wife that I'm just f no good on land. I'm only fit for the wild and fit for challenge. And so his temperament was particularly uh, good for exploration and for the expeditions that he went through. His first was with the Scott expedition on the discovery that charted the coast of the great Ross ice shelf uh, 1902. Uh, later, uh, he was with Scott on the expedition that uh, went, went on to the ice. Uh, he went on his own expedition that far. He was the first man that got anywhere near the pole. He and Scott did not get along well together. Uh, Scott was a naval officer and a fairly rigid and formal man, was given to take, giving orders and not taking any responses. and. He actually set an example for Shackleton on how not to handle men on an expedition. Scott, Wilson, and Shackleton were th together on the earlier expedition, and Shackleton actually felt ill, and Dr. Wilson and Robert Scott actually had to haul him on a sled away and was uh, considered to be an impediment to Scott's expedition. Thereafter, S Shackleton was released from Scott's service and then decided he had to do this work on his own. Uh, he went back to England and tried to raise funds and uh, worked in some different businesses. He ended up taking work on different ships to be able to go out again. Uh, but this was a very dangerous uh, undertaking at the time and uh, he was driven like many to get there. The Belgians had led the first trip there. There was a ship called the Belgica, went out in 1898, went down to the Weddell Sea and actually was caught in the ice and all of the crew went mad and died. And it was a terrible example. And uh, Churchill himself said that uh, this was a business that uh, had enough life and money had been wasted in this sterile effort to get to this area of the world, which there was no particular economic goal or imperial goal other than having been there first. But nonetheless, uh, Norwegians, Japanese, Belgians, French, British, Americans were all trying to go there as, a, as the great prize of the, what they call the race to the pole. Uh, Shackleton himself went back and, and got as they say, is that far. So he became quite a famous explorer on his own, but on that particular trip, he, he did not uh, go all the way because, one, again, one of his own men were so 
deteriorated in health that he decided that rather than lose a man, he would come back. And this was a distinguishing feature between himself and some of the other explorers who felt that death was part of this business, and they had a litter of uh, casualties throughout the poles at this time trying to get to these great goals. Shackleton uh, went back again and tried to fit another expedition. He had not sponsorship from the British government or the Navy who felt they should run their own expeditions, but he was an independent and somewhat re resented by the establishment. He actually went and got Scottish industrialists and private financiers to back his venture to go down again. Now the pole had been first found, reached by uh, Anmundsen, the, the great Norwegian explorer. Uh, he had taken dogs. Scott had taken motorized vehicles and ponies, which were completely unsuited. So when Shackleton wanted to return to go back, uh, he studied the Norwegian example and thereby took a more appropriate uh, dog sleds and skis. But uh, at the time, he wrote that he, he had to go back. He was bored by land, and he quoted uh, from a book called The Ship of Fools by uh, St. John Wells Lucas, and he said, We are the fools who could not rest in the dull earth that we left behind, but burned with passion for the south, and drank strange frenzy from the wind. The world where wise men sit at ease fades from unregretful eyes, and blind across the uncharted waters, we stagger on our enterprise. Well, this was sort of the daring do of the time, and when he got enough funding to fit out his new expedition, he bought a ship, a Norwegian ice uh, polar vessel sail ship called, uh, that he renamed the Endurance after his own family's motto, which was uh, Fortunutus uh, uh, Vincimus, which means by, for, uh, by endurance we shall conquer. And then he named the ship the Endurance, and this is it being fitted out in London, getting ready to go. He advertised in the daily papers for people to join the expedition, and his ad read, men wanted for hazardous duty, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. <laughs> I've applied for many jobs like that myself, but um, he got, he got 5,000 applicants and um, three of whom were women who offered to dress in men's clothing and, and sleep with the men if that would help the expedition's uh, spirits. Now, one of uh, Shackleton's biographers said that was the only challenge that he ever turned down in his life, but he felt it would be bad for morale, and um, such as uh, the way of the sea back in those days, at least. Uh, so they fitted out the, um, the ship and left London in August, of 1914. Here's his wife Emily seeing him off. Uh, she stayed home and had, they had an office that was the expeditionary uh, center. They had administrative staff that helped the pay and the assorted communications and uh, primary to the expedition was the keeping of the journals and particularly they invested in f photographic equipment so that the journey would be documented. They picked a crew of 28 total Actually, it was only 27, and they got down, when, after they sailed down to uh, Rio de Janeiro, then put in in Montevideo, where we were, uh, they came into port, and uh, Captain Worsley, who was the captain of the vessel, would announce that this is the expeditionary ship headed for Antarctica. And a Welshman named uh, Blackbell got aboard, and he stowed away. And he uh, was then found when they set out from Montevideo, and he was brought before Shackleton, the leader of the expedition, who berated him for being a, a stowaway. And he warned them that stowaways are the first to be eaten in the polar waters. And the gentleman said, OK. And then they said, fine, then I'll put you to work. So this is the, the compliment of all of the staff. Shackleton is right there. And that's Captain Worsley. There was only uh, six able-bodied seamen. The rest were all geologists, other uh, uh, sort of other technical personnel, geologists and uh, navigators, a variety of um, uh, scientific personnel had signed on volunteering could no pay just to be able to go along. So many of the men were not so familiar at sea, but they were ready to help in the crossing of Antarctica to have the adventure and also bring back some more knowledge of this relatively unknown area. Now this was the Captain Worsley, who was from New Zealand. He had been with 
uh, Shackleton on his previous trips on the Nimrod, and uh, he, he was a very excellent navigator, uh, especially in rough conditions. He got very good sightings, celestial, and that was very important because the magnet compass would not work down in the polar regions. Their previous trip had actually identified the magnetic south pole. So Worsley, as the chief navigator, was particularly familiar in polar waters and knew how to get places where the compass would be of no use. This was Frank Hurley, who was an Australian photographer. Most of the pictures I'm going to show you are actually his photos, and the, the great drama of this expedition was documented by Frank Hurley, who was said to be a giant of a man who had uh, no fear of heights or depths just to get a picture. And he brought along a tremendous amount of photographic equipment, including the first color slides. And there was an exhibit at the Museum of Natural History in New York a number of years ago of just those slides and then some of his early film work. He brought along the early motion picture film. Most of his pictures, though, were glass negatives. And he took quite a bit, but had to abandon most of them because they literally couldn't carry them. They sat down one day on the ice when they were stranded and just edited out the best of them, of which I'm showing you a selection. Uh, this was the artist, George uh, Matson, who was brought along to sketch the sites. And unfortunately, again, because of their uh, demise on the ice and abandonment of most of their equipment, he could not bring most of his work. He later painted a number of dramatic pictures, a couple of which I'll show you. Uh, he was uh, dressed, as you see, in this uh, reindeer suit. Their Arctic polar gear was actually fairly primitive at the time. They took Burberry wools and pullovers, which were not nearly as good as the good old Norwegian reindeer suits, which they used as sleeping bags and coats at the same time. Now, the ship was fitted out, loaded with as much supplies as they get, could get on board. It took uh, about 100 tons of coal. It was a steamer with a single propeller and a, a big boiler so that if they were going to get caught in ice, they thought they could push their way through. On the top deck, there was a, a kennel built for about 26 dogs that were going to be the sled dogs being pulled through, and they were brought in from Canada. Uh, they became the pets and the pleasure of the long sea voyage down to the south waters. Unfortunately, they were never used, and unfortunately, they were eventually all consumed for food, but they also had puppies. This is uh, Tom uh, Crean, who was the Irish sailor, second officer of the expedition, who was famous for being somewhat sardonic and strong-willed, but also a great friend and a great advisor to Shackleton. And Shackleton picked him specifically to be a second officer because he was a great advisor for the trip. And they were fast friends through the rest of their lives. Crean actually retired to run a pub in his hometown in County Kerry. Uh, Ireland, the South Pole Inn, and if, if you're ever there, uh, you can have some ice in your beer. But uh, Crean was the man who actually was with Shackleton at the very end of the rescue and was key to the expedition. Now, as they were sailing down into the polar waters, the rhythm of a ship uh, requires maintenance and cleaning and such. And in a traditional larger vessel, there would be a separation between the officer corps and the, sa and the sailors. Uh, in this case, the ship was crowded. There was only one cabin for Shackleton. Everybody was in hammocks and sharing a common uh, cabin and salon in the center, and they were all put to duty. This was a equalizer among the crew there. As I said, there were only six uh, average seamen, able-bodied, and the rest were specialists who were chosen to come along, but they were all put to the same sea du duty. Shackleton insisted on this so that there would be none of the class distinctions of uh, labor and um, camaraderie that was typical on the ships of the time. They had a common salon where they had uh, what they call the gramophone parties. They also had theatrical skits and things to amuse them and get together their, their feeling as an expedition and as a crew. Many of them were strangers to each other when they set out, but by the end they all had a very strong bond, of course. They first sailed down to South Georgia Island which is a rocky outpost for whalers. And this is the port of uh, Grit uh, Viken, which means the um, cove, the stove cove in Norwegian. And it's where the whalers would bring in the big carcasses, and they had big boilers, and they boiled it up. And the whole place smelled of blubber and uh, um, uh, death in the sense of the whaling industry was still pretty big at that time. And so there was actually three stations on this island a rough place, the, the last uh, inhabited island in the South uh, 
seas down there. This island is where they would return to, and you can see it's an incredibly mountainous and glaciated uh, island that had never been crossed before, and that is what they actually hiked over at the very end to be rescued. Now then the ship set off from South Georgia Island, right there, came down into the pack ice in February. Now they're sailing in the, the beginning of the austral summer, which is our winter months in the northern hemisphere. The whalers said that the ice was particularly thick and they probably should wait another year. But Shackleton having been ready and there, he said, no, we're going to go ahead. And so then the Endurance sailed into the ice past the South Shetland Islands, which are uninhabited and ice bound. And then the ship came and got caught in the ice down here and began on a big drift around the Weddell Sea. And now this is a, an area that's the size of Western Europe and it gets packed in with ice and then there's a current that, that circulates the ice in a gyre so that the ship was actually stuck in the ice down in the southern area. It was only about 100 miles from land. The original plan was to actually land down there and then set off a land trip team with dog sleds to the South Pole and then cross over to the Ross Ice Shelf on the other side. It was going to be the first trans-Antarctic expedition. It was called the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition formally. There was another supply ship that was sent onto the Rice, uh, Ross Ice Shelf on the other side of Antarctica and a team was laying food supplies on the same route that Scott and Shackleton had been on before on the other side of the continent. Uh, that particular uh, group that went over there I'll speak of later because they did not have as happy an ending as this particular part of the main expedition. In brief, the Endurance was caught on the ice and they would drift, being pressed to the point where the ship was crushed, sank, and then they set off in their three small boats trying to make it back to the north. They ended up being marooned on Elephant Island and then they took their great navigation in one boat across back to South Georgia Island. Now this is a shot of the ship as it's entering the ice pack. Uh, that is Shackleton right there. Uh, this is a, a very fearsome sight if you're in a wooden boat. There's no such uh, daring do these days. The ships that go down there are ice class with double hulls and reinforced prows that can break through the ice. This was a very tough Norwegian polar vessel, so they thought they could actually get through. Uh, here is a shot of Hurley uh, with his movie camera getting a, a view of the ship as it's entering the ice pack. Here's Captain Worsley uh, in front of the helm giving an indication of which way to head through the channels that are between the pack ice. Now the, the helm is behind, this is the binnacle and the compass, but th they put up these canvas windbreaks because th by this time they were beginning to get storms and uh, the wind was very cold and icy and so they would put up a windbreak, therefore the captain would go ahead. He'd have someone at the bow watching to see which way to turn in the ice and then uh, he would indicate it by that, that wooden board. And here they are getting into thicker and thicker ice. The ship is beginning to slow down to the point where they'd have to wait till the ice would separate some and so they could make some way. They began to burn more and more cold, push their way through when there was no wind. This is an example of what the ice looks like down there. On the northern side of the polar ice uh, packs, you get what they call uh, brash ice, which is fresh ice that's just forming and it makes sort of ponds and puddles, and then it begins to collect into a larger sheet. This is um, uh, broken ice off of the ice shelf, though. And these are much thicker and much harder and cannot be broken through. A ship can sail through brash ice fairly easy. Uh, in the terminology down there, the, these kinds are called bergy bits. Uh, I think uh, it's also a snack for kids these days, but that's part of the Antarctic ice shelf that will calve off and put great uh, uh, icebergs into the water, one of which we should be passing soon, being towed to Dubai, as we understand from the captain. Um, and uh, here's a typical iceberg. These, as you well know, are massive pieces of ice that are one-seventh above the water and then they are vast below. At times they are uh, very become very unstable because the top end of it will begin to melt and it can create a, a disequilibrium in the center of gravity and these things will shift, particularly if they are uh, disturbed by the wake of a ship. So when you are navigating through them, you have to be careful if you get too close uh, 
and you give them a bit of a wash, suddenly they'll turn on you and they'll, they can ram a ship even though you thought you were well out of the way. Now here's another view of the actual course of the event. Uh, this is what they call the Australian view of the world with the south up and the north down. Uh, here we go from South Georgia into the ice pack. Then they become beset January 18th and the ship is stuck in the ice until it comes and is finally crushed by the ice ridges. Then they set off in their boats and go to Elephant Island and again back to South Georgia Island. Here is the ship trying to sail through it, which seems somewhat of a romantic notion. But some days there was quite a bit of wind, they would set the sail, so this was a, a motor sail effort to get through the ice. Uh, they, the crew would go down and with pickaxes break channels and try to make way a very arduous work. But they made it hundreds, hundreds of miles that way, but it was very, very uh, painful and cold work on a, on a gray and bitter day down there, even though this is the summertime they were heading down there. The ship would then enter these pack ice that began to roll up on itself, and these are called pressure ridges, such that the flat ice would suddenly become uh, buckled up and then pile up on itself, and then the the sea would become fairly impassable because that would uh, ice in and then suddenly the ship was caught completely and there was no way getting through it. The ice had become many feet thick. They couldn't possibly chop through it. And at that point they kind of hunkered down for an entire winter. Uh, they would go out and exercise the dogs on the ice pack. Uh, they had games and uh, activities out, go skiing on a nice day. But uh, they had hoped that they would get down in the spinning of the ice pack to a point where then it would break up a bit, they could continue on the expedition. Unfortunately, uh, the ship did not have enough strength to survive that particular plan. And um, they would build a, what they called dog loos out on the ice pack so that the dogs would not be cramped on board. It gave them more room on, on the vessel. They put out a camp, they called Ocean Camp, outside the vessel. Um, these were particularly beautiful pictures uh, that uh, Hurley went out to take on the, on the pleasant weather there. They actually moved the kitchen out on the deck, or rather out, out on, the, on the ocean camp uh, to make room below deck. Uh, they had brought along a um, sterno like canned petrol so that they had an adequate heat supply. And then they would go out and hunt uh, for penguin seal to add to their provisions they had brought along. Uh, then at night, Worsley and the uh, third officer would go out and do celestial sightings to see where they were. So they kept, kept an accurate log of where the vessel was, even though ice bound, it was still moving along in the uh, flowing ice. Uh, here's a portrait of the entire complement of the expedition out one day, plus the photographer. Shackleton organized games and tried to maintain morale as best as possible. As he was uh, quoted, enemy is not the ice, the enemy is morale and the infighting among the men. Uh, he was famous for being able to squash any dissent. If anybody had complaints or was ill, uh, he would go to them and talk to them and he would not just be brusque and rude as many a naval officer might have been. Uh, instead, uh, he was what someone described him as a, a Viking with the heart of a mother and that he cared about his men to the degree that he did not let them become rancorous or even ill. Uh, he himself often gave his provisions and his uh, rations to any man that was ill. And so he engendered a great deal of loyalty and also fortitude among the men. Uh, this is one of the seamen, Hudson, who was sent out to catch penguins. And this is an unfortunate fact of the expedition is that the, they had to then live off of the uh, game of the area they would go out on hunting expeditions and then bring back penguins. Uh, this is the cook, his name is Green, and he would prepare um, penguin uh, steaks and penguin fritters and penguin this and that, but they, they ended up uh, uh, boiling down a lot of the, the penguin blubber and they made a delicious meal called hoosh, which was a, a boiled blubber that they had seasonings in, and we are having that at lunch today up on the <laughs> top deck. I, I will try to cut the talk short so there's enough for everybody. They dined in the salon and uh, it was not a very formal settings but uh, uh, at this point in the expedition they were still well fed, they were all healthy and they expected to go on as soon as the 
the winter time would let up. Uh, they would gather around the ship's stove in the night and uh, tell stories. And so there was a lot of camaraderie at the time. And they had uh, musical instruments, uh, particularly one of the seamen, uh, Hasi, had a banjo. And this became an important uh, uh, item when they were abandoned on Elephant Island. They said if it wasn't for the banjo and uh, the, the, what they called the mental medicine of music, they would not have survived. This is a view of the ice pack in the, as the spring came upon, and uh, this is a, a kind of an ice formation that they call ice roses, where it crustles up and then it actually gets a, an algae bloom on it and it turns pink. And so if this were in the right color, this would be all pink, like a, like a lovely spring field. As the ship was moving north and the spring came on, it was getting warmer, uh, it began to rain and uh, sleet, and so the, the rigging became all encased in ice. And this is a famous picture of the ship that Hurley made out at night with some strobe lights that show the, the rigging all sheathed in ice. And for a ship, this is still a very dangerous thing. In polar waters, if you get too much ice on your rigging, it can actually make a ship top heavy. And it was a traditional job to go up and have to break it all off. In this case, the ship was all bound. It wasn't going to go anywhere. But then it began, the pressure ridges as the ice began to move, began to heal the ship over. And this began the, uh, the demise of what um, Worsley called our gallant ship was being slowly but surely killed by the ice. And this was, uh, gave the, the sailors a great sense of gloom and doom because this strong ship could not take being laid over on its side as it began to then be chewed by the ice layover, they had to then uh, declare abandoned ship. And this was one of the bleakest days of the expedition. Uh, it was October 27th, at the beginning of the summertime down there, that they decided that the ship actually was of no use anymore. And they decamped all of the provisions that they could onto Ocean Camp on the, on the ice flow. And they watched for a few weeks as the ship was slowly but surely broken apart. They had tried to save it with pumps and seals, and the uh, carpenter McNeish had tried to seal up what holes were breaking up, but the, sh the ship was being twisted, and the ice was unrelentingly strong on it to the point where it actually devoured the entire vessel. And uh, you can imagine how they felt sitting on the ice where no one knew where they were. They knew where they were, but no one had any idea. They had no communications. It was a couple thousand miles to anybody that might even think of where they might be. And so then their vessel was just literally eaten. And then they were abandoned just to their supplies and to their wits. Um, at this point, Shackleton realized that his expedition was a failure. But he told the men, that doesn't matter. We must go on. It is our duty to get back. We'll try again another day. As a, he was quoted as saying, it's better to be a live donkey than a dead lion. He did not want to press the expedition. His goal now was the safety of his own men. And this became his triumph because he actually did rescue them all in the end. Now they then packed up their gear. The, the ship's boats were then loaded up with gear. These weighed over a ton each. They put them on adapted dog sleds and they themselves started hauling. They figured that they could get a certain distance toward uh, the Antarctic Peninsula and then perhaps up to one of the whaling stations uh, sent out and, th and then they would eventually uh, be rescued. But this was a tremendous effort. They had quite a bit of gear. They abandoned all kinds of things on the, uh, on the ice. Uh, they were not allowed to bring any personal items other than the survival gear at the time. Uh, the Bible that Queen Alexandra gave Shackleton as good luck for the journey, he actually took out her page of commemoration and one page out of the book of Job, which said, out of whose wound, womb came the ice? and the hoary frost of heaven. Who hath gendered it? The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. So these men were faced their own Job-like experience to extricate themselves from certain death. Many others had died down there in previous expeditions, and so they, they became quite gloomy, though by the determination of their leadership, they carried on, they built their camp, uh, they maintained morale. They were not sure quite what to do. They, they knew that the ice was still moving um, and they were still heading north slowly, but it was a question of how long they could catch game, how long their food would uh, maintain. Shackleton made a decision at one point that they should decamp even further and haul over to yet another camp. 
At that point, the carpenter McNeish got up and angrily said that no, we shouldn't do that, we should stay right where we are, and he uh, proposed an, a, a mutiny among the men, at which point Shackleton got out the ship's articles and read them, first of all, that any mutiny is punishable by death, and that anyone who refuses orders will be arrested on the spot. But then he said, this is much too serious a situation for us to have any dissension at all, and he actually relented. He said, all right, we will not go marching because the conditions were so hard uh, to get over the, the ice ridges. He said, we shall wait till the ice breaks up and then we'll go. And so then they all agreed about that. So Shackleton, in a sense, uh, relented from his own plan in the face of a mutiny, but then he decided that it was better to have the consensus of the men than to have a squabble of any sort. So they carried on living on the ice flow until a certain point where the, the, the temperature was getting warmer, the ice started to break up, they had a case where they were in their tents and in the night uh, the ice separated and a couple of the men in their sleeping bags fell into the ocean and sh they heard this crack and Shackleton himself got up, went and, and grabbed and pulled these men out of the water himself because there's no way they could swim in a sleeping bag in the deep, but he saved a couple of the men on that point. At that point, they decided they'd better get out of there, and so they began to prepare the boats for a crossing of the waters. They packed all and everything into these three small boats that were named the Cairn, the Docker, and the Willis, named after three of the sponsors of the expedition, and they sailed for about a week through the ice flows. This became actually the most miserable part of their trip. When they were on the ice and they had a modicum of comfort of a tent and such that was all right, but suddenly they were out into the cold and wet waters of the, of the Southern Ocean and they were being washed by cold waves. There were storms. They tried to head uh, to Deception Island, which was a whaling station, which was maybe only a thousand miles away, but they knew they, there were ships there and they might be saved. But that was against the wind and against the current. And after a, a week of being beaten by the elements and tracing through these ice flows, they, they realized they couldn't get up toward Deception Island. And the decision was made to go instead to Elephant Island. Uh, that was due north and they could sail a beam the wind and get there. They ended up camping on ice flows at night, but there were storms and they were afraid they were going to lose each other. In this particular illustration by Marston, you can see there's a line tethering the boats vaguely there. They tried to keep together because in fog and such they would easily be separated. So it was very difficult sailing. They, they uh, got uh, frostbitten bitten, and they got dysentery while on the boats. And they also had uh, left most of their food behind. They couldn't carry their, their stockpile of seal meat. Uh, they were down to just a biscuit a day each. And they said they had uh, a biscuit a day. For breakfast, they would look at it. For lunch, they would suck on it. And for dinner, they would eat it. There's also a special on that in the uh, Britannica restaurant tonight for dessert, if you like. <laughs> Finally, they came on to Elephant Island, which is a very scary looking island. It doesn't really look like a nice, friendly elephant. It's mostly cliffs with glaciers and very little uh, flat land at all. But uh, this was the island that is on the north end of the Antarctic Peninsula. Beyond that is the Drake Passage, which would be another 800 miles of open sea. They didn't think they could possibly cross that in their condition. So they decided to land on this island and just stay. This is now Cape Wild. They call this particular pinnacle where they landed. Uh, it proved to be uh, too rough with uh, ocean waves breaking over the rocks on shore and they uh, landed but then they moved to another place on the island which was a bit flatter where they could actually build a camp. And here the men pulled the boats up on shore. Uh, Blackbow, the stowaway, was at this point so frostbitten he couldn't walk and he was worried that he might be lunch. Uh, the men were also in such a state of ex exhaustion and hunger that, uh, as uh, it was written in one of the journals, uh, many had, had lost the top of their head and they were uh, dazed and they couldn't speak and they didn't know what to do. They were disoriented. And at this point, Shackleton was very concerned that even though they had survived this far, that the men were losing their will and they're losing their minds, literally. Uh, you can imagine the uh, in this picture they're having their first uh, hot uh, tea and uh, 
at, for the first time in a week, and they're on shore. They've been living in the same clothes for almost a year. So I'm, I apologize, I do not have a, what they call smell-o-vision in this particular uh, presentation, but uh, they were a pretty sorry lot, but they were still all alive. But the morale was so low that Shackleton quickly decided that there, there had to be a, a break rescue attempt, and he decided to take the largest of the boat, called the Cairn, off and try to get help. Um, the carpenter McNeish stripped uh, planks from the other two boats and he raised the gunnels of this vessel. So that's all added on and then they took some uh, tents and they covered it because they realized that if they're going to cross the Drake Passage or some of the, the great uh, terrible waves of the Southern Ocean, they would need a more sturdy boat. So they fitted it out and they decided that six of them would go. Uh, it was Shackleton, Worsley, the captain, navigator, McNeish, um, Vincent and McCarthy, and Tom Crane. And they were considered the healthiest and the strongest and the most skillful sailors. So they, they packed the boat to the guild. They added a lot of rocks as ballast because they realized they'd be tossed in terrible seas. They actually had jagged rocks all on the bottom and they were all camped in sleeping on rocks which would cut their bodies in the night as they were trying to rest. They'd take turns on watch. And then they set out the men wondering if they'd ever come back. Uh, this was on April 24th. And they sailed out into the misty, stormy seas there. Uh, and I've been actually down right off that beach and sailed out of there out on a zodiac. And it, uh, right as soon as you get out of the bay, there's 20-foot waves that are roaring as we saw off of Cape Horn. But usually, this is a, even rougher down there. The currents are very strong. And so the men see them off. Hurley took all these pictures and uh, made the documentation of the event. They then they camped into the, the remaining two boats. There were 22 men huddled in these two vessels at the time, overturned. And they'd get out and exercise every day. But it was another 128 days before they would be rescued. So they lived on this little rock, not knowing if anybody would ever come back for them. Uh, so the. The cairn is set out. They had thought that perhaps they could sail to Cape Horn, uh, but that is against the uh, current and against the, the headwinds. They thought they might have, they could go to the Falklands, which is somewhat further, about uh, 800 miles away. But they, again, they thought that that might not be successful. If they hit a bad storm, they'd be blown off course. So the decision was made to sail for South Georgia Island. That is more or less to the northeast from where Elephant Island is so that they thought if they had a strong current and they could sail a beam the wind, they could probably reach that without any trouble. The problem is, is that in, in those terribly big seas, uh, trying to navigate with a sextant and celestial sighting means if you make an error of one degrees in your calculation, that'll be 60 miles. And out in that ocean, if you miss at all, you will continue going without seeing any other land forever. And so this was a great gamble and one of the great achievements of navigation that Worsley was able to calculate so carefully that they actually did, after 14 days, have a sighting of South Georgia Island. Uh, I was reading that he, he actually had to be held by two men as he stood up on the surging seas to make a sighting, shouting out his numbers. And they did this repeatedly through the day whenever there was a break in the, in the sky. And he was able to plot a course over 800 miles till they sighted South Georgia Island. When they got there, uh, their, their boat was racked by a terrible uh, storm came up, a hurricane force wind. So they were right off the shores of the ragged mountains of South Georgia Island, but still they couldn't land because they would have been smashed against it. They, they wanted to go around onto the, the lee side of the island to the whaling station, but the, the weather was so strong they couldn't make it. So they stayed two days off tacking up to keep off the rocks when the storm passed. Then they went in and landed, and they could barely walk. Uh, as uh, they were quoted as saying, their, their legs were not fit for land anymore. Uh, they had also very bad frostbite. Uh, they had run out of water. Their water cask had actually leaked and, and they'd lost all their fresh water. And drinking seawater will make you quite ill, as you may note if you have a glass up at the bar after this talk. Um, <laughs> so, but then they got around and they landed, but they were, um, they were expecting to actually then go back out and sail around the island on a good day. But uh, when they landed, because they were on the windward side of the island, there were waves still breaking on them, and th when they pulled their boat up on the beach, they went back to see how it was, and they found the rudder had been broken off. 
And so here they were disabled at that point. Uh, so then they were faced with the task of the only way to get to help was to hike over this island for which they had no map. No one had ever crossed it before. And it rises up 7,000 foot peaks right there off the beach and is covered with ice fields and crevices and such. And so again, they decide, well, this is uh, uh, just a minor uh, obstacle. So they gathered three days of food, but they had no tent, no sleeping bag, no boots. They actually took uh, brass screws out of the boat and they screwed them through their boots so they would have enough traction on the ice. And so Worsley, Shackleton, and Tom Crane started hiking. And they went up and up, and the, they hiked for 36 hours without stopping. And they crossed over the mountains. Um, at a certain point, uh, they fell into a crevasse, uh, and they, were, they pulled it themselves out. It could have easily killed any of them. Um, at another point, they were so exhausted, they got to a place to rest, and they uh, began to nod off. And Shackleton realized that if they fell asleep, they would all just die. And so he woke them up saying, oh, you slept a few hours, you should be good. They'd only, they, the only other two had been out for about five minutes, but he realized that they, would, they wouldn't be able to get up again if they didn't just keep going. So they continued to hike uh, in a state of utter exhaustion till they finally got down um, to the whaling station. And they walked into the, uh, the street, the muddy street of the whale station, and uh, the first person saw them was a young um, boy who saw them and ran away screaming, thinking they were monsters. They were so hairy and dirty, and they'd been uh, a year and a half without a bath and such. Their clothes were completely ragged because they had, at one point, come to an ice field that they couldn't see a way down. It was foggy, but uh, it was getting dark and cold, so they decided that all they could do is just jump, or rather slide down the ice flow. And they took their rope, climbing rope, and they tied themselves together, and they just prayed, and they just slipped down the ice uh, they estimated they dropped 3,000 feet sliding down a glacier in the fog, not knowing if they'd hit a rock or a great cliff or whatever. And then they ended up uh, crashing into a snowbank, and they all kind of laughed and said, I can't believe we made it. Well, in this particular part of the trip, the three hikers, after all of this travail, they felt, later they each wrote, that they felt there was always a fourth with them, which they then called Providence. And so they felt that this was a almost divinely blessed adventure to rescue them that against all of these terrible conditions and odds thereby they made it in and when they showed their face to the whalers in the station and they were called in to the uh, head of the station uh, who's, who knew Shackleton from years before they'd seen them off uh, a, uh, the, uh, the year and a half earlier he said who the hell are you he didn't recognize them. They, and then they said I am Shackleton and then they they just uh, started to uh, gawk and began to cry. And the, in Shackleton's journey, he said he'd never seen a Norwegian fisherman cry before because they were just amazed that they had made it. Then they were received. Um, they immediately got a boat to go try to pick up the three others that were left on the other side of the island. Uh, when they came ashore to pick up the other ones, Shackleton himself went in the boat and his own men didn't recognize him because he'd had a, uh, a bath and a shave. And they were so exhausted, they didn't, didn't know who, who was coming to get them. At that point, they got another uh, British vessel that came into port, and they tried to go back to Elephant Island to pick up the other uh, 22 men. Uh, because of the pack ice, they couldn't get there. The ice had come in, and they were kept a few hundred miles off of the island. It took three other attempts before the men were finally rescued. Uh, Shackleton went to Punta Arenas where the Chilean Navy gave him a steel tug that could push through the ice and they got in and got to the bay and as you can see this is Hurley's picture as, as they they stood up amazed that actually somebody had come for them every day they, they'd stand watch 128 days they were kept busy um, just trying to catch enough food they were again hunting for penguin and such on the on the ice floes but when the the vessel came in to, to rescue them. Uh, Shackleton called out, all well, and his uh, second officer, uh, Weil, said, yes, all well. And then they came into the uh, bay, and they counted the men. And the men were so surprised that anybody came back for them, they couldn't talk. And they, Shackleton went up to greet them, and they were their slack jaw. They, uh, they were just so uh, amazed that someone had finally got back for them. And then within an hour, they packed up their gear, they got on the vessel, and then they went back to 
uh, Punta Arenas, flags flying, crowds cheering, and these men who had been so desperately lost at the end of the world were suddenly the toast of town and they were uh, feeded to, fested to banquets and taken on a parade and at one point in, in the club on the corner of that lovely park in uh, Punta Arenas where we were, uh, they had a big formal reception and uh, they were armed guards of the Chilean Navy at the door and one of the sailors asked the guard, says, why are you guarding us? And they, it was at the uh, crush of the crowds outside and the so sailor was said to have answered, no, we're not going to allow you, any of you gringos out of here until you're drunk. Um, <laughs> so then they went home with great celebration. The word got around the world. Um, it was a particular terrible time because World War I had broken out. And at the very beginning of the expedition, Shackleton had offered his ship and his crew for the war effort. And Churchill, First Lord of the Admiralty, had just sent an answer back, no, proceed. So they had missed a year and a half of the war, and they were shocked to hear that millions were dying in the fields of Flanders and such. Four of them went back, immediately enlisted, and were killed within three months. So they were, uh, the, the timing of this particular expedition was particularly tragic because of the war going on. Um, and then, as I said, some of them went and joined immediately. But uh, it was a triumph of human will and endurance that they survived at all. And that became a very big news in, in England in particular, and they became very celebrated. Shackleton himself stayed on in Punta Arenas to go get his other party, which had been sent onto the Ross ice shelf to go lay supplies for the Trans-Antarctic uh, Hall. On that particular group that went on the vessel called the Quest, there were only about 15 on that ship, but the shore party of 10, three of them died on that particular mission to lay supplies. And so there was loss of life, but it was on the supply side. And uh, also, that particular vessel that they were on broke its mooring and drifted away. So they were abandoned and had to be, the, the, the remaining seven had to go get picked up. So Shackleton actually went and rescued his other party. Uh, it's a footnote to his own insistence that his own men all be cared for. He delayed his return to England for many months just to make sure the rest of his men were uh, taken care of. Now Shackleton went back and was a great hero, and he was acclaimed and had wrote his memoirs of the trip and such, <clears throat> so that he became quite a celebrity, but he was still uneasy. He did not like the land life, and so he gathered his resources again to take another expedition down in 1922, and he uh, went on a vessel that was prepared to go down and do geological um, studies of the rocky coast of Antarctica and do soundings so that the Admiralty could have better charts of this era, of the area of the polar waters. But on the trip, he was um, again with Worsley and Tom Crane and a few of the other of his first expedition members. He w they were in Rio de Janeiro, and it was so hot that he himself had a fever and had a fainting spell. They continued on to Montevideo, and then they went down to South Georgia Island, and on the vessel, he had a heart attack when they landed at South Char Georgia Island, and he died aboard the day he arrived. And this ended the expedition. They turned around, and they went back to Montevideo. And when word got back to Emily in London, she said, no, it's best that he go back to the ice where he always wanted to be. And so he was taken back and buried in South Georgia Island uh, in the bay where he had first visited and then gone, hiked over those mountains to rescue his men. I believe the message is we've turned around to head for Antarctica. <laughs> well, well, anyway. Well, I, I'm at the end of my talk, so I'll, I'll just finish here. Shackleton's model of leadership is unmatched in modern times, and his own writings and his example have been uh, spread around the world as an example of courage and endurance in the face of failure. His own personal motto was never, for me, the lowered banner, never the last endeavor. And he epitomizes uh, the comment of Napoleon that a leader is a dealer in hope. And Shackleton certainly was that. And in his tribute, I'm happy to present his expedition and hope we don't have to go through the same trouble in our lives. Thank you very much.